Hey, I'm very excited today to be joined by Dr. Miriam Mikitsky. She is a UK trained GP and she boasts clinical experience from the US, China, Japan and Poland. Uh, she was also one of the first people to be certified with the Institute of Functional Medicine in the UK and was one of the UK's one uh, one of the UK's first functional medicine practitioners. And I'm very excited today to have her join us to talk about how we address test results. So that what I find is I come across two different people um, in the category of test results. One of them is people who have had test them with a doctor, and often the doctors told them that they're fine, or maybe even not that they're fine, but that there's not much they can do, or they just need to take this drug, and people kind of want to understand this test results better, and they want to take it into their own hands. And so the key thing there, I think, is understanding not just what a doctor thinks is fine, but actually clarifying what's optimal. The other side is I see a lot of people who actually do their own tests um, without any kind of doctor, without any kind of practitioner, and they don't really know if their results are something that they need to be concerned with. And so I'm so happy today to have Dr. Miriam, we're going to call her Dr. Miriam because it's easier for me to say than her surname. Um, I'm so excited today to have Dr. Miriam join us because she's going to help us with both of those. She's going to help us to understand, um, and hopefully we'll do a series of these, and we're going to start with the most basic ones, the most common lab test results. What does it mean? Why do doctors commonly order it? But then, as I said, most importantly, at what level should you be concerned about your results? And then at what level do you ideally want your results? Do you optimally want your results? So thank you so much, Dr. Miriam, for agreeing to do that with us today. Thank you so much for having having me here, Owen. And uh, definitely I'm happy to sort of put, I would say, a little bit more of my you know, GP catastrophic thinking on, um, but also kind of interplaying it with um, what's more optimal in one's blood results. Um, because generally, uh, as you said, I think I have, um, you know, I see it both sides. Normally there's that dilemma where everything looks quote unquote normal on someone's blood results, but the patient still feels pretty terrible. And that's often how they show up on my doorstep. Um, but then also we have more, I'd say, proactive patients who, you know, don't really see their GP or family medicine doctor that often. And then sometimes it's just a little bit concerned if something's out of range, just because they don't want to, sometimes they even just feel like, it. I would say embarrassed to even go to their GP to say that they're, they're taking their health into their own hands and checking their blood tests. So yeah, so basically I'm here to kind of tell you where, you know, maybe this might need a second look and just to kind of make sure that either things are optimal or just to make sure you're not missing anything big and that you want to have that investigated um, kind of a more conventional setting. Yeah, thank you. And I'm so glad you were able to do this because as you said, there's not, I have not come across many people. I think there's very few who actually do, are able to see it from both sides from the, you know, you can relate and understand, as you say, a very standard NHS GP point of view, but you can also relate to and understand, uh, you know, a very advanced um, uh, functional medicine practitioner who's looking to fine tune. So it's really great to get your perspective coming from both of those uh, ends of the spectrum. Um, so Dr. Miriam, as I said, hopefully we're going to do a series of these with you. Um, and so just before we get into uh, explain to people how to read their blood test results, let's uh, just get a bit of background on you, if that's okay. Can you tell us um, what brought you to this position of uh, having such a high level of experience in you know both of these different modalities certainly so i mean i've always been um quite interested in sort of natural medicine and preventative health mainly from my family's background so my my mother's a sort of a traditional um uh, medical doctor and my father trained in traditional Chinese medicine uh, so there was a lot of kind of like arguing at first between those two modalities at home but actually my mother um sort of got more interested in Chinese medicine and then started to train in integrative medicine as well, kind of before functional medicine really existed. Um, so I just, you know, kind of got used to um, using more, I'd say, herbal remedies at home. Um, I also think, you know, with doctors tend to be the worst patients. So in terms of like, you know, when I was getting sick or somebody in the family would get sick, we would usually be trying to um, treat it using more um you know, more natural remedies. Um, and yeah, and then basically, you know, eventually I decided that I really wanted to um, 
you know, I really wanted to go into a similar field. And, you know, I guess even though I'm really grateful for my conventional training, um, you know, emergency type medicine isn't really the type of medicine I like to do. So then I also um, you know, started to train in functional medicine. So I was sort of training in that when I was actually still in medical school and kind of felt like my medical career, career was just kind of going towards doing more integrative, functional, preventative medicine. And I feel like all those uh, nights in A&E and sort of intensive medicine type of shifts were just something I was really glad to leave behind. But then, you know, I think also, yeah, also something that, and from the point of view of making sure that we're not missing anything big or catastrophic from blood tests, I think gave me a lot of experience too. Mm, yeah, fantastic. Um, you know, we, we were speaking a bit behind the scenes last week and uh, you were talking about how you really do, you are more passionate at helping people to optimize as opposed to, you know, waiting until people are in a life-threatening situation. And that is the exact opposite that I've observed with most medical doctors. They literally are not interested unless you are almost dead or could soon be almost dead. Um, so what, what do you think uh, led you to be more interested in helping people to, you know, be optimal, peak performance, all that kind of stuff? Um, in general, just uh, I really enjoy working with patients who, I mean, I would say that I see a very diverse range of people and, you know, you can see that um, you just meet the most interesting people and you really want them to continue doing what they're doing at an optimal capacity. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, I, it just makes sense, to be honest, like you, you really want to, you know, I, I would say that especially in the UK and to a certain extent in the US, um, I found that people people just kind of sort of tend to ignore the problem. Like I know in, you know, my family is originally from Poland and in Eastern Europe, it's quite normal to like get your blood test done every year just to see. Um, and, you know, even when you hear about certain, like, you know, certain more, I'd say, serious conditions like certain cancers, there really are no signs or symptoms un until it becomes too late. So, to me, it just makes all the sense of the world to get as much data as you can about yourself or, and just, you know, to make sure that everything looks optimal. And then, you know, even we'll get into this, but even certain things like your hemoglobin or your uh, red blood cell count decreasing, you know, that doesn't just happen spontaneously. There's usually a reason for everything. So to me, it's more, I guess, a bit of detective work um, and, you know, really trying to analyze that data and putting it together with somebody's story. I just find that work very fascinating. Awesome. Well, let's get straight into it. You already mentioned it. So there's the CBC. I think that's thrown around on, uh, you know, medical shows like House and ER and all that kind of stuff. So uh, what does that mean and why do doctors order it so frequent, frequently? I mean, um, so the CBC uh, or FBC, I guess, is a full blood count, as we call it in the UK. Um, you know, most, I would say most GPs, myself included, just zoom in on um, the hemoglobin um, and so um, more you're looking at, let's say, your red blood cells, and then there's a part that looks at your white blood cells and then your platelets. Those are sort of the three um, three kind of types of, of blood cells we're looking at. Um, I think we, we're going to take a bit of a deeper dive into this, but you know, generally, uh, if your hemoglobin's okay, at least from the red blood cell point of view, most doctors sort of ignore the rest, but there's actually a lot of information we can find in just in those markers. That's interesting uh, because, yeah, of course, if hemoglobin is all that matters, then why bother doing all the rest? Um, so, all right, let's start with hemoglobin. What does it actually uh, mean? Hemoglobin is just a, um, I mean, I guess the easiest way to describe it would be that it is a, um, a protein that... Um, essentially um, helps you to, you know, to um, transport oxygen through the body. Um, and essentially, red blood cells contain hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is just that a protein that is attached to the blood cells. And that's essentially how we get perfused, how we get oxygenated. And I would say in terms of chronic illness, we, we often see poor oxygenation and poor perfusion. So too little blood kind of getting into areas is a big part of you know, chronic illness and, and low energy. So it's it's very important, but officially, medically, if your hemoglobin is under a certain amount, you're considered anemic. So that's maybe something that you may have, most people have heard of before, um, meaning that the hemoglobin is too low and that you might have a problem with 
perfusion and therefore might suffer from symptoms like low energy or even shortness of breath um, or uh, you know, certain uh, like a high heart rate, those sorts of things. Okay. And so we're going to tell people again what the optimal range is and what the range is whereby you should you know, probably see a medical professional. But let's go through, as you said, some of the other ones that maybe the typical medical doctor might ignore, but which often, as we say, are on the tests anyway. Um, so, and let's explain each one briefly, and then we'll go through again and, and talk about what the optimal levels are. So uh, what's uh, hematocrit? Let's do that one next. So, um, so basically, um, again, th these first few markers we go through, they pretty much all relate to your um, to your red blood cells. So the hematocrit is just your blood volume of red blood cells. Um, and so just like with hemoglobin, essentially if it's too low and there's too little blood volume of red blood cells, then that might be from either um, an iron deficiency or if there's been excess bleeding and there's just less, or less volume, then your hematocrit might be lower. Um, and on the other hand, if the hematocrit's too high, it usually means that there is actually um, too little fluids and more kind of a sign of dehydration, particularly if the rest of the markers look okay. Okay. And is there ever a time when the hematocrit would be too low and the hemoglobin would be just fine or vice versa? And if so, does that mean yeah, anything? Generally, um, if the hematocrit is too, is too low, um, we can see certain nutritional deficiencies. And I generally tend to see that with an iron deficiency. Um, you know, and, um, and, you know, I, I say that pretty much if any of these markers are out of range, there often can be something going on, even if the official hemoglobin looks okay, which is why it's important to kind of examine each, each one. So that's why you check each one. Um, what about the red, red cell count? So that's just, um, really the kind of amount of, uh, red blood cells and, um, you know, essentially, the reasons for it being too high or too low are quite similar to to the hemoglobin. But essentially, we're you know we're looking at a number sort of between, um, you know, usually it will say something like, um, you know, three to six would be an optimal count. But um, you know, generally, if the the red blood cell count is low, I normally also attribute it to certain vitamin deficiencies. Apart from iron, we also have things like. B6, B12, folate, um, whereas with a higher count, again, could be from dehydration, um, but also could be from certain environmental factors like smoking or um, low blood oxygen levels. So All right, well, now we're getting to the area where I often have had them slightly out of range, although not enough that any doctor has ever cared. <laughs> but, uh, so we'll talk about uh, what that means in a minute in terms of optimal ranges. But so we've got a bunch of abbreviations here. So the first one on my list here is MCV, which I think stands for mean corpuscular volume. So uh, what does that mean? So mean, mean corpuscular volume or MCV is basically just the, the size of the red blood cell. Um, and this is one where, again, even if, uh, so I would, I just, I guess I would, um, phrase this just to say that all of this sort of relates to then the hemoglobin. So if you go to your doctor, typically if, if you're not anemic, they don't care about the rest of these, but for MCV, um, you, you actually find that the size of the red blood cell can vary depending on how, on your nutrient factors. So, um, you know, for example, um, if you're, um, the size of the red blood cells are smaller. We typically see that with iron deficiencies. Uh, if if the um, volume is larger and the MCV is high, we often see that with things like B12 and folate deficiency. And so I don't have B12 or folate deficiency, but it still is usually slightly above the reference range for me. I'm just looking at it still was recently. It does say it can also be caused by... Uh, underactive thyroid which i think you know i have still been struggling with and which you're helping me with um and it said that it's it's called macrocytic anemia is that a term that you're familiar with i'd say that by and large the most common cause of macrocytic anemia is b12 or folate deficiency but then i guess if we kind of take that if we expand on that why are you deficient in those it might be because of a general issue with absorption um you know and we can see that with thyroid issues. So in your case, um, 
while it might not necessarily be those two nutrients, there might be an issue with just overall absorption and motility, which we commonly see with thyroid, um, you know, with, with hypothyroidism. Uh, so I guess, I mean, you know, you have to take all of these markers, the red blood cell count, um, and with, you know, your hormone levels, your kidney, your liver function. So it can be quite difficult to just like each, you know, to, um, to, to basically derive things from each individual marker. You have to obviously put it into context with someone's um, condition and, and how they're feeling. Yeah. And I have to say, no doctor has ever been concerned about it being slightly high because of the other markers, as you said. But yeah. Um, OK, so the next one is mean corpuscular hemoglobin or MCH. So what's the difference between that and MCV? <laughs> okay, so MCH and then MCHC, those are actually two that I also typically don't really pay that much attention to if the hemoglobin's fine, because it, essentially all M MCH is is the amount of hemoglobin per red blood cell. Um, and so generally, if you know, if it's a little bit out of range, it's it's usually because the hemoglobin is a little bit higher compared to the red blood cell count or vice versa. Um, but um, I, that one is one I generally don't, I, I'm not too fussed about on its own. Um, but we know that, for example, if the, for example, the hemoglobin count is high per red blood cell, um, you can even have that with things like training. Like, for example, if you train at high altitude, your MCH will usually be higher because your hemoglobin count is going to be a little bit higher. Um, yeah, so but I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of take that one as an isolated marker. What about if you did long breath holds like Buteyko method or Wim Hof or something? Would that uh, increase the size of them? Actually, I mean, I think if you're, um, I, you know, I think for, for long breath holding, certainly, because you um, really would want to kind of try and hold on to as much oxygen as possible when you're kind of depriving yourself of it. So I think it could. Um, and in a way, I mean, you know, when people train at um, at higher altitudes, they, they want to increase their hemoglobin to get more oxygen on the cell. So I would imagine that any sort of exercise that helps you to, to do that and helps you kind of function in a lower oxygen environment would, um, you know, would 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 affect your MCH. Interesting, yeah, because mine did go over the range for the first time when I started doing Buteyko method breathing, which is where you know you get used to holding your breath for a very long time. So I was I always wondered if it was actually an adaptation as opposed to a problem, given that I didn't have a deficiency of B twelve or anything. So that's interesting. Um, at last, I have a doctor answer that question for me. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, on the list as well, I see RDW, um, red blood cell distribution width. Is that one that you pay attention to? So, um, you know, with red, red cell distribution width, I think the easiest way to um, define it is just that it's a variation in the size and the volume of the red blood cells. Because ideally, you want red blood cells that are around the same size that are fairly pliable don't really break so uh, it's generally I would say the lower the um, the variation the better um, and so your red cell distribution width just essentially measures if they are more or less kind of equal in size or if there is a big difference between the sizes um, yeah I think that's the easiest way to explain okay. it uh, so yeah, so the mean capacitor hemoglobe is like how much hemoglobin is in there, but the red, the RDW is like what size they are in terms of the variations. Okay, that makes sense. And so, at what point um, would you be paying attention to that specifically, or why, 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 why bother testing for it? I guess. Why bother testing? Because it's actually a really good inflammatory marker. So um, I, um, it's usually measured in terms of a percentage. And so, you know, normal will usually be somewhere between 11 and a half and 15, but like optimal is about 11 and a half to 13 um, percent. And essentially, if it's higher, we, we see then more kind of abnormally shaped red blood cells. And uh, that can be a sign of inflammation and oxidative stress. Um, it's you know i think if it's um as far as i know it's not really a problem you don't really see rdw being too low um you know because you're going to see some variation in the blood cells are not going to be exactly the same but generally it's the higher the more inflamed somebody is 
Okay, interesting. So mine is 14.2% the most recent time I did it, I can see. So that indicates a bit of inflammation then, because when I do a CRP, which we haven't talked about yet, but which is kind of the standard doctor inflammation marker, right? Um, C-reactive protein, it's always like the lowest it can possibly be, like 0.3 or something like that. So so w would you say the RDW is a more sensitive test than the uh, C-reactive protein, or is it just different? A little bit different. I mean, I would say that, um, I mean, I wouldn't be worried about yours so much, but um, essentially, um, if you think about it, it's almost as if, like, if if there is, let's say, not enough oxygen getting through, or there might be some nutrient factors that are kind of making the red blood cells a bit more fragile, then, you know, you can imagine if, like, your red blood cells were, like, some of them were stretched out, some of them had parts broken off, um, that's not ideal. And so it's essentially a sign that there are there's maybe a bit too much damage to the red blood cells. Um, but, you know, you're still well within the normal range. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit like, I mean, maybe more so, because I think if we look at blood markers and inflammation, apart from um, RDW, I'm also looking at things like ESR and also mean platelet volume. So if I take those into combination, it makes me think of vascular inflammation. Um, and so, you know, just to give an example, like a lot of my patients with autoimmune issues or who've had things like temporal cell arteritis, that's where we're really markering, uh, we're really looking for markers that could signify vascular and blood vessel inflammation. Uh, so that's where I think it comes, you know, just becomes a bit more As important. opposed to systemic inflammation. Interesting. Exactly. Okay. So yeah, ESR actually was on my list, but later that's erythrocyte sedimentation rate. But that is erythrocyte is red blood cells, right? So we, we could definitely talk about it here. Um, so let's talk about that one. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate. What does it mean other than being a marker of inflammation? Essentially, I think the easiest way to explain it would be just a a marker of how um, how slow your uh, blood cells are kind of clumping together. And so if the ESR is high, it's almost as if the blood cells are a little bit stickier and clumping together. And that is a more a something that we see with inflammation. Uh, but it's one we specifically see with certain autoimmune disorders and certain like vasculitis type um, uh, type symptoms. Interesting, okay. Okay, so before, I think we'll do platelets next, but before, before we go to that, let's just talk about the um, optimal and then worrisome levels for each of the markers we talked about before. So let's start from the beginning again. Uh, hemoglobin, what's the optimal and what's the level which you should really see a doctor? So optimal is actually different for men and women because in, in, in women, um, you know, women will be uh, menstruating, women will be losing blood each month. So the level is also just a little bit lower. So the optimal for um, for women is around um, in the UK between sort of 135 to uh, 145 grams per liter uh, or uh, in the US sort of 13.5 to 14.5 grams per deciliter. Um, and it's just slightly higher for males. So it's about 14 to 15 for men uh, or uh, 140 to 150 grams per liter for men. That's the optimal. That's the optimal, yes. Okay, awesome. Um, and, w uh, and sorry, why is it, uh, maybe you covered this already, what's bad about it being any higher than that? I understand what's bad about it being lower, I think, which is that you're losing blood, right? Um, or, and not transporting oxygen. You're losing blood. Um, I mean, I would say so. Generally, if the hemoglobin is high, it's um, it's just in general that there is um, it, it's unlikely to be um anything serious. However, we know that people that, for example, might be more predisposed to blood clots um or who are uh, who actually um their blood is reacting to low oxygen so for example if they've had a history of um a, you know a heart attack or a pe their body actually produces more hemoglobin to try and hold on to try and get more oxygen to to their cells but that can actually be a sign that um that there is um that your body's like more likely to just produce clots um so that's where we where we worry um you know but it's rare and i would say if it's in somebody who as you said, spends a lot of time in high altitudes, um, potentially also gets a lot of hemoglobin in their diet. So from, let's say, a high 
very high protein diet or like a carnivore type diet, then your hemoglobin might also be a little bit higher. Yeah, and you wouldn't worry about it in that case. So that's where you have to ask the, the patient uh, like about other factors. Um, and so what are the levels where a person should worry? I'd go to a doctor. I would say that if, I mean, if the hemoglobin is sort of over over 17 or 170 um it's good to just take that into account with the red blood cell count um with the hematocrit and also just see is there any could there also be some family history of any um could this have run in the family because there are certain genetic conditions where you can have really high hemoglobin um and would just be worth getting it checked um you know i think it's it's one of those factors where if you have a high hemoglobin and let's say you're either losing weight or you're a smoker, then then obviously there's a bit more concern to worry. Um, you know, but it's just something that in general, if you don't have any other risk factors with it or any other symptoms, then likely they'll just do another recheck in in a couple of months to make sure that you're okay. Okay. Uh, what about low levels? At what low level should you go to a doctor? So with low levels, I would say that um, because I see quite a lot of patients with absorption issues, low iron levels, uh, gut thyroid issues, I tend to see a lot of low hemoglobin counts. Um, and I'm a bit more worried if there's a drop in hemoglobin. So for example, if your um, if your count has dropped sort of by a factor of um, of two or by a factor of twenty on the British um, on the British sort of uh, index, then you probably want to just figure out why am I losing so much blood? Um, you know, sometimes it can be as simple as women with heavy periods. They might just be, you know, might be losing a lot of blood through their menstrual period. Um, and uh, but generally, it's we're more worried about a sudden drop than hemoglobin being low. Um, and that's actually where you kind of also think about more sinister causes, like for example, colorectal cancer, um, you know, anemia, where your hemoglobin is under thirteen. That is sort of one of the markers that you look for because it's a sign that you're losing blood, and um, you know that would be one reason you would be losing blood. Um, but I would say, generally, if you're, I mean, if your hemoglobin is under ten, I definitely think you should be having that investigated. Um, I think if your hemoglobin is under 10, then you probably don't feel so great and you would have had it investigated. But there are some people that just have lived with anemia for a long period of time and have almost adapted to it, but still something worth to explore in more detail. Yeah, I think I know someone like that. Um, interesting. Okay. Uh, so what about hematocrit? What is the uh, optimal level and at what level should you seek help? So, um, you know, with hematocrit, um, the optimal ranges are around, um, it's usually also in a percentage. Um, so it's going to be either like 37 to, to 45 percent or 0.39 to 0.45, depending on which country you're in. Um, and that's, um, yeah, so that, that would be sort of the optimal range. Um, if so again, if you have a normal hemoglobin, so you're not anemic, but your hematocrit is high, so over that, um, I mean, generally, this isn't one that we sort of look at, that I wouldn't necessarily go to a doctor because the hematocrit is high. We usually have to take it into context with, I would say, slightly more important markers. But um, if it's sort of going over 50% and we don't think you're dehydrated um, and you know, the hemoglobin, generally you would see it with the hemoglobin being high as well, um, then you might have something, I mean, it's quite rare, but you could have a condition called polycythemia vera, where you produce, overproduce the hemoglobin. That's actually quite a serious condition. But for that, you would have to see levels, um, you know, even sort of close to 60%. So I think um, this is one where I probably wouldn't go rushing to the doctor unless you have other symptoms of, an, of anemia, so shortness of breath um, and, um, or sorry, not of anemia, but if you have other symptoms that uh, that just aren't right, like your oxygen saturations might be a bit low um, or you are um, just feeling quite poorly. But it's not one, if it makes sense, that I would be necessarily like analyzing to a T. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, and uh, what about the red cell count? Optimal and concerning. Um, and the red cell count, um, optimal should be around 
four to five. It's, um, red blood cell counts are usually measured like a single number of times, like 10 to the 12th or 10 to the 9th, but generally it's sort of a single digit. Um, I would say that, um, I mean, I'm, again, I like to correlate it with the hemoglobin, but uh, generally if the red blood cell count is sort of double that, then you yeah, you, you, you might just worry, but uh, there could be some something like polycythemia or some um, genetic condition. Um, but generally, you would, you, would, you would tend to correlate that with a high hemoglobin count. Okay. So rarely an issue if without hemoglobin. So next, I don't know if you want to do them all together. MC, well, no, let's do them one at a time just so we can tell the optimal level. Uh, what's the optimal level for the MCV? The MCV, so... Um, Optimal level was around 85 to around 92, I would say. That's kind of what I came to conclusion with. But, you know, I would say that, again, most practitioners, if your hemoglobin is normal, they're not going to worry about your MCV. But from a functional medicine point of view, I still try and get uh, look for various signs of nutrient deficiencies. Um, so, you know, for example, if the, if the MCV is... Um, you know, if your hemoglobin is, let's say, a little bit on the lower end of normal and your MCV is less than less than 80, then I, you, normally we see either an iron deficiency uh, or a B6 deficiency. Um, and generally, we can see quite a lot of absorption issues. Um, so I like to correlate it more with digestive function. Hmm, interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and then high high MCV, normally, if it's over 100, that's that's where... If we're, if we're looking at it in a person who's anemic and we see the MCV over 100, that's where we think of um, B12 and folate. Um, but again, could it be just an, an overall problem with absorption? We see that too. So with things like SIBO and bacterial overgrowth and a high MCV, it makes you think of micronutrient deficiencies. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and then the MCH? Uh, the MCH, um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, that one off the top of my head, because they vary so much, I probably couldn't tell you like an exact um, optimal range. But, um, you know, I, I just think that it's, you know, it is somewhere between like 25 and and and, and 31, I believe, or 33. But basically, it's, um, you know, again, generally tends to correlate with the hematocrit and the the MCV. Um, it, it's not, you know, and, and yeah, so I'm not one that I would say that there's like an optimal number for, but somewhere between that range is normal. Okay. And the MCHC, I guess you're going to say the same thing. Yeah, I think it's also quite similar. It's somewhere between like 32, 35 and um Generally, again, if it's low, we tend to see it more with anemia and high, more with these sort of um, what we call megaloblastic anemia. So that tend to be because of certain vitamin deficiencies. Um, yeah. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, let's move on to the next thing in relation to red blood cells. And I think we'll, we can do this one fairly quickly, although maybe not. Uh, and that's platelets. All right. So uh, the, I think the first thing that we usually see is platelet count. So what does that tell us? The platelets out of the three, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, platelets are actually your um, smallest uh, blood cells. And, um, but they're very much um, reactive to, they basically help you co um, as coagulate and reduce bleeding. Um, so, you know, generally they're just very important for your clotting and, um, we we actually can derive quite a bit from from platelets. So I'd say the optimal range is around uh, 175 to 250. Um, and in some countries, that's actually 175,000 to 250,000, depending on how it's written. Um, but yeah, that's what we're what we're looking for. Okay, and and uh, you said this was related to inflammation. Is that because? When there's inflammation, like uh, when there's inflammation on the tissues, this is just a guess on my part, like on the artery wall, that there's more clotting going on to try and um, like see, make sure that it's there's no holes in there, there's no tears or anything. Is that is that correct? 
So if, it's interesting that if the platelet count is low or if it's too high, you can get actually um, problems with uh, blood clots and coagulation. So if there's if the platelet count is too low, there's usually a problem with um, something is destroying those platelets. Um, so so sometimes we can actually find low platelets due to um, autoimmune conditions. Um, due to certain medications and even due to certain certain cancers, but they're they're quite rare. Um, now, um, high platelets are usually almost always kind of inflammatory related, but there can be some genetic disorders. Um, so it's called thrombo. So thrombocytosis is with platelet count is too high, and thrombocytopenia is if it's too low. So sometimes you'll 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 hear those words being thrown around. But generally, if the platelet count is high, we're worried about either a coagulation disorder or um, or an inflammation. Um, and we, I, often if you see, for example, your mean platelet volume, which we'll get to being high, as well as um, your hemoglobin being high. So going back to the red blood cell count, often we do see, um, you know, we see, auto, we, we just see an inflammatory state, essentially. Interesting. Is there any other reason? Because I was just thinking with mine, mine had been high in the last uh, seven, eight months, something like that. And it's actually happened since I started taking massive doses of vitamin K2. Um, would that potentially increase the amount of platelets? Because it's supposed to increase, um, yeah, it's supposed to increase them, isn't it? Uh, yes, I mean, certain um, vitamin K, well, vitamin K2, um, and platelets, I have to think about that because actually the um, vitamin K2 can really help with, um, can help with clotting. Certain botanicals I know can increase your platelet count. Um, vitamin K can help with when platelets are low. Um, in your case though, I mean, how, how high are you, have the platelets gone? Has, have they been like completely out of range? Well, no, but at the border, no. uh, I think it at was the border. the border of the reference range, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I would say that. Um... And yeah, sorry, I mean, K2 was just an example. Is there anything else that people might be doing? As you said, is there herbs they could be taking or is there anything else that would, uh, you know, like garlic is supposed to uh, reduce clotting, for instance, right? Would that reduce the platelet count? I'm just wondering if there's anything else that would affect it. I know, for example, like um, certain herbs like angelica and some of actually some of your like TCM herbs that help with um, blood deficiency and that that with, you know, people who, for example, are always cold all the time and uh, are blood deficient. Those herbs generally can increase platelet counts. Uh, I don't think, though, I mean, I haven't seen it where somebody, let's say, who has a low that has a normal platelet count. Those sort of herbs have increased it to a dangerous level. Um, but you know, I know that, for example, also, um, you know, things like um, papaya leaf, chlorophyll, those can also um, increase uh, increase platelet count. Um, but, the, you know, these are, um, you know, generally things that um, I know to increase platelet count when, the, when they're low. Um, generally, I wouldn't use them if somebody had a high count um you know we'd be looking for things to lower a platelet count which um you know things like for example omega-3s can help lower a platelet a high platelet count um what about uh natokinase and those kind of things that people take to stop excessive clotting would that be something you'd recommend yeah actually i mean i love to use natokinase actually especially in people with um like hypothyroidism um or those who've had a history of um, blood clots where we know that generally the blood has this tendency to to clot um, and so that's actually one of my favorite things to use not to kinase and it, it just uh, just to make sure I'm not uh, conflating anything here is there a connection between the platelet count and clotting so meaning if someone has a high platelet count does that mean they have an inc increased chance of excess clotting or is it actually not necessarily the case it's related platelets though are a little bit um tricky in that um, both too many platelets can cause blood clots, so there's a correlation, but also um, if there is um, too little, that also affects the coagulation marker, and then you can actually have this combination of bleeding and too much clotting. So it's a, um, but yeah, generally you kind of correlate high platelet count to kind of 
thicker, bigger platelets and more clots and more inflammation. Okay. All right. That makes yeah. sense. Well, which is an important thing, right? When it comes to, you know, cardiovascular health is usually the num one, number one or two killer. So that sounds like it's a marker worth observing. Um, what about mean platelet volume or MPV? That's usually another one that comes up uh, as well as platelet count. Yes. And that's actually, um, that's actually one of my favorite markers, um, just because it is, uh, it, it can be um, a really good marker for inflammation in our um, in our line of work. So um, optimally, we're looking for an MCV less than nine. Um, and you'll see most actually normal MCV reference ranges are somewhere like eight to, to 13. And so people are like, how do I get this under nine? Um, but it's a measure of just how, again, how big the platelets are and the platelets trying to increase in volume in response to an inflammatory signal. And uh, I have to say, even in things like uh, long COVID, um, you know, recurrent infections, I see this very high. And that's kind of one marker that I always work to try and get as low as possible, because it's actually quite difficult to get it under, let's say, under eight. Um, but uh, that's where we're really using things like, um, you know, like natokinase, like omega-3s. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, but generally one that um, I really like to look at. I, I would say that I kind of zoom in usually on, if I had to, of all these markers we've talked about, I really like to zoom in on hemoglobin, um, platelet count, mean platelet volume, and then I'm sure we'll get into this, but the white cells, and that, yeah. that's kind of another big area. We'll do that next, yeah. yeah. So, all right, so just, to, that's awesome. So just to clarify, um, uh, so the optal range really is low as possible on that range. Is it ever too low in reality? No, I've never seen no. a mean platelet volume too low, ever. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just I'm just looking at mine. Like my last one is eight point eight, and I see last year it was as low as seven. So does that does that indicate anything if the MPV is very low, but the the platelet count is high? You're still in a good position that you know you might potentially have a bit of a genetic predisposition to higher platelets. Uh, but maybe if if, if you are taking natokinase, to, um, then that might be one of the reasons you've lowered it so much, or just in general anti-inflammatories, because generally you tend to see it the high. You tend to see lower platelet counts with lower mean platelet volume. Okay. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a mystery then, but I'm not going to worry about it because the MPV is still quite low. Would that be the kind of bottom line? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Fascinating. This is so cool. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. The white blood cells, again, super important. I think I've done a video on this not long ago, how most of the uh, top 10 reasons that people die could be correlated to a not properly functioning immune system. And I always love to remind people that everyone always talks about inflammation, but inflammation only exists because of the immune system, right? It's, it's ultimately an immune response. So the immune system is super important, uh, not just for keeping diseases at bay, but also for preventing most of the uh, chronic diseases that kill people. So let's talk about um, the white blood cells. Do you want to speak about them in general before we get into each one? On that, on that note, I completely agree because, you know, we always talk about inflammation, but we know that the white blood cells do produce a lot of inflammation to help us uh, fight off infections. And we kind of always want to strike that balance where, you know, we have enough white blood cells to be mounting a response against our viruses, bacteria that, um, you know, and any infection we've caught, but then also aren't creating too much of a response that's leading to a lot of inflammation and chronic health conditions. Um, but I think a lot of times, um, because I see a lot of people who have uh, chronic issues who are almost you know, tend, and autoimmunity, you tend to be more worried about that inflammatory phase. But actually, if somebody's white blood cell count is too low, we can also see that you know, they might be more susceptible to repeat infections. And so we really have to be a bit careful. And that's actually something that I would say is often ignored. People are very fixated about high white blood cell counts as a sign of infection. But if you look at your white blood cell count and, and you know, certain subtypes are low, you also see that with depleted immunity, which then, you know, if you look into why might somebody have depleted immunity, that could also be stress, um, poor sleep, uh, poor adrenal function. And that's it's very, it's a very important kind of bit to look at. 
And a chronic infection as well, right? I, I often see when people's, when one of the white cell markers is below the range, especially like neutrophils or monocytes. Um, when I ask them, they've had chronic infections going on for ages. So that can kind of deplete it. Is that right? Exactly. Because they're just not mounting a response that anymore. And sometimes you can actually see a low white blood cell count directly after a viral infection. Um, but if you just see it persistently a low a low uh, neutrophil a low lymphocyte count then you know you're just not able to mount that good response against a virus and uh, and that's where um in terms of sort of like treatment strategies i've actually learned quite a bit from traditional chinese medicine they kind of have a long history of uh fighting off pandemics and viruses and i've i've you know, when we worked in that sphere and we're really trying to balance the white blood cell count, I found certain treatments very helpful there. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. Interesting. Okay, well, let's talk about it for a second. We've really kind of started talking about it, but the first one usually on the list is the white cell count, right? So uh, what does that mean and what is it telling us? Why are they testing for it? Um, so that's looking at kind of a composite of all your white blood cells. And uh, as we'll get into, there are quite a few many subtypes. Um, you know, generally you'll see it appear on most um, t on most uh, panels as you know, normal somewhere between like three and and ten. Uh, I like to see that count between kind of five and eight. Again, it's usually times like ten to the something, but um, you know, generally that's how it presents. Um, and now I find um it's a good composite marker of how your immune system is doing, but I this is one where like as opposed to you know red blood cell and hemoglobin, this one I really like to go into the subtypes in a lot more detail because I just find it can give us a lot of information and often even in you know in patients where you know they can't really um you know we're not able to do kind of fancy testing to look at cytokine panels or um you know, like various kind of oxidative stress markers, sometimes just looking at that white blood cell breakdown can give us a lot of very useful information. Very interesting. Well, okay, rather than me asking you one at a time, why don't you go through them, you know, in the order that you look at them in? That might be interesting. Yeah, um, sure. So, you know, I look at usually the first one that pops up are your neutrophils. And those usually are, uh, you know, approximately half, about 40 to 60% of your white blood cells. Um, and neutrophils are the white blood cell that really help you fight off bacterial infections predominantly. Um, and so as opposed, as opposed to fungal or any other viral, yeah, any other type, as opposed to viral, yeah. viral, um, infections, you tend to see a rise in your lymphocyte count, which I'll get to in a second. So generally it's, it's quite useful because if you don't, if you don't know, you know, is it a bacterial or a viral infection? Often that can be one of your first clues. If your neutrophil count is high, it's typically bacterial, um, and um, uh, what about if your neutrophil is low does that also indicate bacterial or so something that, different that one's a bit tricky so yes generally it can mean like you, that you have just kind of recovered from a bacterial infection and actually your immune system is now really depleted um but you can actually see low neutrophil counts with viral infections but typically you would also see a higher lymphocyte count too yeah um, uh, and what about if neutrophils and lymphocytes are both on the low end? Does that mean that the immune system is generally struggling? Yeah. So I was going to say your lymphocytes, which are the white blood cells that typically help you fight off uh, viruses, they make about up about 30% of your white cell count. Um, so if both both the neutrophils and the lymphocytes are low, that's usually your, just your white blood cell count is going to be low as well. And that is usually seen with um 
with infections with kind of a depleted uh, like people who have recurrent infections a very depleted immune system uh, also people who potentially could be on certain medications so it's always worth kind of you know looking looking into that um uh, but, but yeah something that you want to then try and try and uh, boost and help and if they're both high does that indicate you've got both types of infections or does that indicate maybe that there's an autoimmunity going on how would you uh like differentiate there um, if they're both high, um, again, it depends how high, because I would say that if your um, if your neutrophils and lymphocytes are sort of double the normal range, then you probably need to get that investigated. Um, again, very rare compared to the amount of people that are getting infections, but you don't want to um, miss something like a lymphoma or a leukemia. Um, and but generally, those those levels tend to be very high. Um, you know, it's like so, I would say if you're you need sometimes you can actually see your your counts go up double just because of an infection um you know but uh um I, I guess just to kind of put that sort of again catastrophic thinking hat on but if you're having anything like night sweats um losing weight and your white blood cell count is sort of double limit then generally you really should be um seeking some um primary care and going to your gp or family doctor uh, or even if you're feeling very poorly um even you know going into um more kind of an emergency setting just because um you know obviously some of those conditions can be very serious but generally i think if you'd felt feel that unwell you probably um most people would also be um um yeah would be seeking help so it'd be very unlikely it would be at a range that's dangerous without you feeling terrible, basically. Yeah, I guess I forgot the most obvious things. Obviously, if you, those both of those counts are very high, you're likely to have a significant fever as well. So, um, you know, if you, if you check it, your temperature's over, you know, over let's say like thirty eight, and you're sweating and you've lost weight, then that's that. Those are more kind of signs that we're we're very worried about. But you can also have those kinds of signs with an infection. So it doesn't always mean something, you know, something cancerous. Yeah. Okay. And so would it ever be like really high without having a uh, elevated temperature or is that just not possible? No, you, um, you can, cause again, it's, you know, some people just really aren't, really aren't mounting a very, um, profound immune response. So, um, you know, especially like for example, people with thyroid issues who can't really regulate their body temperature very well. So you don't necessarily have to have a fever and also for you know if you let's say you have a thyroid issue and your body temperature is low in general you might then have a normal temperature but that's actually kind of a sign of a fever for you yeah that makes sense <laughs> okay so the next one is uh monocytes there is um, some practitioners look at something called the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio um so if the let's say the numbers aren't too out of range um you can also just see lymphocyte count decreasing slightly and neutrophils increasing due to inflammatory, um, due to kind of a response to something inflammatory in the body. So, um, you know, we're looking at um, ideally a ratio of about 1.2 to 2. Um, and if that, um, basically, if that number goes up, then that is a sign, another inflammatory sign. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, it 1.2 to 2 so let's say uh mine is 2 and 1.5 so it's about 1.3 so that's that's within the range but if if my neutrophils are like uh three and a half and my lymphocytes are one and a half that's outside the range and that would indicate inflammation exactly um, okay yeah okay um, that's great yeah Interesting. And then also then going to the next one you mentioned monocytes. Um, that's um, that's quite an important white blood cell that's generally used for more immune surveillance, um, but also will um, increase with certain infections. Um, and so like one virus that we often see with people who have been suffering from chronic fatigue uh, or certain neurological conditions is Epstein-Barr virus. That's kind of a bad uh, infection trigger for many things, um, but often um, if, if one has an EBV infection that you see your monocyte count really increasing, um, and that's a sign that there's just a, almost an overactive immune response. Okay. And, and if that's, uh, above the reference range that indicates that, or if, even if it's just at the high end. Yeah. So I, and I should have said that actually the monocyte count, usually it's also dependent on a, a percentage. So you're usually aiming for four to 7%. 
as kind of a normal range. Um, so anything above that can indicate Epstein-Barr is active. Yep. I mean, there are others as well, but Epstein-Barr is probably the most famous one. Um, and But yeah, generally kind of also an overactive immune response. Okay. Uh, and then there's eosinophils. Yeah, eosinophils, which I re I say it's probably my favorite white blood cell count, um, of, of my favorite cell because, um, you know, we now nowadays see a lot of things like um, long COVID, high histamine, MCAS. It's really this kind of a big topic nowadays in immune uh, in immune health. And um, your eosinophils uh, are a really specific type of white blood cell that we see elevated with um, certain allergies. So both like food allergies, environmental allergies, also with parasites. But uh, you know, generally in the Western world, we don't see that much parasitic infection. Um, and so these are kind of the white blood cell count that's linked to more atopic conditions. So you'll often see people have had histories of hay fever, asthma, eczema, where their eosinophil count is high. Um, uh, and often I'll also see it with, um, you know, with people with MCAS, where they, because um, eosinophils are um, involved in that process of kind of stimulating the immune system which eventually leads to that degranulation of mast cells and histamine release. Um, you know, but that's and, often, yeah, that's a big clue sorry, there. Yeah. Can we just explain MCAS for people? Okay, so um, MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome is, is becoming a bit of like a buzzword diagnosis nowadays because generally your mast cells are another immune cell that, um, release histamine and a uh, histamine can be responsible for many symptoms like um you know uh, runny nose sinus problems uh food allergies skin rashes um you know generally those are of people that we would classify as atopic you know histories of hay fever um and you know, we now think the reason why it's kind of becoming um, a big area of research is with like long COVID. There's a theory that actually the, the immune response that people have after COVID might relate to and that the symptoms that you see there like fatigue, brain fog might actually be linked to high histamine and just those immune cells really being stimulated. Um, and, and, you know, I think nowadays, because we still don't have a concrete test for long COVID, you know, we look at certain markers like um, histamine metabolites, uh, your your enzyme that produces histamine. But, you know, if you're looking at just a basic full blood count, your eosinophil count can actually tell us if you might be more susceptible to that kind of overactivation of not just histamine release, but in general, other inflammatory cytokines. Interesting. And so... Um... Oh, uh, yeah, I was about to ask you the markers, but no, we'll do it at the, at the end like last time. Uh, let's just go for the last one. So that's uh, basophils. I mean, basophils, I have to say, I hardly ever see this out of range, but it's a, another immune cell that um, you can see more elevated with allergies and environmental factors. Um, and uh, and actually also are related to um, to kind of histamine release. So basophils are another immune cell that, can eventually lead to that mast cell releasing histamine. So, but they're rarely elevated. So I wouldn't say that it's kind of one that I tend to see out of range. Um, if I see a basophil out of range, there are some, again, ra very rare cancers um, that I would probably be referring if your basophil is out of range because it's not a very common thing to see. Okay, interesting. Yeah, just look at mine. My latest one is actually zero, which I guess is a good sign. Um, but the highest it's been is kind of the mid reference range. It does also say it can raise levels, can be associated with hypothyroidism. Is that something you've come across? Because I know you deal with a lot of people with hypothyroidism. I've, you know, I've studied that, but I've never actually seen there be much of a correlation. Um, and normally it comes back at zero. Um, I'd say that's kind of the baseline. So that that's why I'm a little bit worried if I see it come back as. It's usually normals around zero to two percent. So if it's higher, then it makes me think something else might be going on. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um. And then just before we get into the reference ranges, I also have in my list here uh, IgA and IgE. Um. Is that something that you ever test? If not, we can skip it. Um. I do test it, and I mean generally, um, the thing is with the IgA, IgE, um, those 
those are very much lab dependent, but I would say that if um, if they are out of range on your lab test, um, that could be a sign that um, that you're generally trying to fight something off, especially if there's a lot of gut, um, you know, gut dysbiosis. And, and basically it means that you're producing quite a lot of um, immunoglobulins, immune factors to help you fight off an infection, um, you know, which is, you know, I'd say generally a good thing because you want to be able to stimulate your immune system to do that. But too high levels, I, I tend to correlate that with, you know, what I would find on a stool test um, or, um, or, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the digestive system, but any kind of mucosal surface. So also potentially sinus infections, certain lung infections. Um, if those levels are low, um, I often see that also with chronic fatigue, adrenal depletion, and I often actually replace, um, you know, give people immunoglobulin mixes to try and promote, you know, to kind of help boost the immune system. Uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, I think I've seen those before made with bovine something or yeah, I think I know what you mean. Um, immunoglobulin supplements. Uh, what's the difference between IgA and IgE? So I mean, IgA uh, is essentially the, the main um, immunoglobulin produced by the mucosal surfaces. Um, and so you tend to see it, um, yeah, again, more linked to, um, yeah, gut lining health. IgE is usually um, really only produced in response to kind of an allergic reaction um, or, uh, yeah, so um, you generally, I mean, to be honest, it's not something that I generally test myself the actual level so much. It's usually if I have a suspicion that somebody might be, um, you know, that they have a lot of food allergies and there might be a genetic predisposition, I might check a total IgE. But um, I guess I don't check IgE in particular that much because uh, it's often associated with more severe allergic infect, you know, more severe allergies, so more kind of your anaphylaxis type of picture. And people with those sorts of allergies often, you know, they do need um, some level of like conventional medical care because you can you can become very very, very unwell, let's say, if you're exposed to something that then mounts an IgE response. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, all right, awesome. So let's go through, and I realize this is difficult for you to do because there's so many different variables and factors. So feel free to go into those whenever we, uh, you know, whenever there is one that occurs to you. Uh, but Let's try and take each one in isolation for the sake of people going through their own results along with us and, and wanting to evaluate them. And then, you know, by all means, as I say, tell us if you would check another variable along with it. But uh, yeah, so what's, I think you already said the optimal level for a white cell count, you'd want it between five and seven. Um, what is the level at which, or is there a level which you would recommend medical intervention or is it, as you said earlier, only based on symptoms? Like if you actually are feeling very ill. Based on symptoms, but I would say that I mean, if you're if you're looking at your white cell count and it's over kind of double your reference range, I would first like ask myself, okay, have I had any sort of infection recently? And most people kind of think about, um, you know, uh, colds and respiratory infections, but just you know things like, for example, UTIs, um, gastroenteritis, all of those can raise your white cell count. Um, so I would just um. Yeah, that, that's when I would be worried. I would say if you're on the lower end, if you're sort of, you know, less than, than, you know, less than three is not really great. Um, I, but, you know, it's a, it's a tough one because there are many things that can lower your white cell count. People who are in general very adrenally depleted might see their levels so low, um, you know, but if you're seeing actually low white cell count, low neutrophils, low lymphocytes, everything is low, then occasionally you can have certain toxins um, that can do that. And certain conditions like aplastic anemia that you can see with certain quite heavy duty medications as well. So it's worth just uh, worth looking at. Okay, so really anything below the reference range is worth looking at. Okay, all right. Uh, and neutrophils? I mean, neutrophils, you know, this is where um, generally um, the 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 actual the actual number can very much vary uh, on on an individual blood test, but I would say this is sort of one where you're looking at 
you know, you want it, you're wanting to be kind of towards the low end of normal, um, low middle, because uh, um, means you're not having too much of an active infection and not too much of an active immune response. But then, yeah, yes, yeah, so I, I would say that in isolation, I'm more looking actually towards those things like eosinophils. But um, in terms of like an actual neutrophil count, you know, um, generally you're wanting it to be about half of your white blood cell count. So somewhere between like 2.5 and 4. Okay. And I've seen a few times with mine, for instance, it's just below the reference range in the past. So that wasn't something that I was ever concerned about. Should I have been? <laughs> no, again, it can oh. neutrophils can become depleted after a viral infection too. Um, so you, you know, might have been that you've had a, you had a past viral infection, and generally you can see both both levels going low if um, again immune system is just not working optimally. So if you've been under a lot of stress, um, and um, you know, and you uh, your adrenals could use a little bit of um. A bit of a boost. Um, I mean, just kind of personally, I, I remember when I was, you know, when I was around 16, 17, and I was at boarding school, um, and I actually just went to boarding school. It was a bit of a stressful time for me. Um, my white cell count went really low, and I had a lot of investigations, and then literally within a couple of months, came back to normal. So you can sometimes find it with, you know, in an incredible, in what in your life is an incredibly stressful time obviously it's different you know people go through different things but for me it was you know being away from home um and you know so it's something that generally it's worth repeating fairly regularly especially if they are on the low side because it might just be really an acute stress reaction too hmm, interesting and we talked about this on this podcast many times how the stress reaction goes up then the immune function goes down um so okay uh lymphocytes what's the optimal range for for those again it's usually somewhere around um you know one to one to three one to four um you know but you, but that c can vary based on your your individual lab but i would say that you're going to wanting it to be around the mid-range mid-range ideally okay awesome and i won't ask you about the extremes because they seem to be the same with every case of the white blood cells um what about the monocytes what are we looking for optimally there Optimally, um, again, that's often, you'll often see these, um, particularly once you get to like be, um, monocytes, basophils, eosinophils, you'll see it as a percentage and an actual value. So it's often easier to look at it as a percentage, but you're looking at it to be about um, four to seven percent for the monocytes. Um, yeah. Four to seven percent. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, the, and, uh, the eosinophils? Uh, you said this is one of your favorites. It's interesting because generally you often see it as zero in a lot of people, which usually means that there's not much of a, an issue with, again, potentially ATP allergies, parasites. Um, sometimes, I mean, you're looking, um, you know, ideally then the normal range the optimal range is somewhere between zero and two percent. Um, in a lot of blood um, blood samples, though, I've noticed that they you know they're saying sort of over four percent but generally if 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 i see it that it's sort of even above two percent i usually ask about those symptoms and to see am i somebody who you know i do have a bit of an atopic history and if i see that eosinophil count even a little bit above that range like over two percent sometimes i will just include things that help to lower histamine or help with kind of um calming down an overactive immune system just based on that because i found it just really correlates clinically very interesting and in fact you know full disclosure i had mine elevated and you did give me something to reduce histamine i think and it actually has been very effective so uh yeah just want to yeah say, i pounce uh, on that marker when i can't basically yeah. <laughs> yeah very good and that's uh, honestly that's one i didn't know more much about before i met you so um i suspect a lot of people watching also won't know that so dig out your white blood cell <laughs> results this is something you can look at um that uh you know could be uh, very important for you um, and it can indicate, you know, MCAS as well as allergies, as you said. And that's something that you can look into. We might do an episode on MCAS if people are interested in it. So remember to leave in the comments if that's something that you'd like to know about. Because I think it's one of the things that you, you know a lot about, right, Dr. Miriam? 
also in terms of those those sort of um cases are always interesting because I can definitely go into some like case studies or things where I've had some really interesting presentations and um, blood tests and results so I'd be happy to do that because I you know I think this is this is really important that we're going through um, blood counts but of course you know I recognize that it's it's, it's a tough one because generally I want to make sure people are safe and not missing anything big but I think it gets a lot more interesting when you kind of correlate it with people's symptoms yeah definitely yeah this is really as I said just for the either the do-it-yourself people who are um wondering what the results actually mean or the people who've had stuff from doctors and have been told they're fine but they're really suffering as you said like the kind of people you see a lot just to give them some clues as to what might be going on well next i, I can't remember what we planned but i'm thinking that actually maybe iron status might make sense because uh we talked about hemoglobin and anemia and stuff like that earlier would that be okay to and and, and also there's quite a few different things that i think a lot of people don't really understand um would you mind going for the iron status ones Certainly, no, we can definitely um, go through that. I would say that um, with iron status, uh, I'm generally looking for um, ferritin count is probably the most important. Um, and but the reason iron is so is is just so interesting is because um, I I think iron is in a sense been a demonized by the functional medicine community um, because generally we see like high levels of ferritin so ferritin just to kind of define it is just the um, can be considered a measure of your total body iron stores however um, if your ferritin level is high uh, it can also you also see that with um, with inflammation and not necessarily iron overload um, so you have to take it into account that actually somebody might have a normal a, a normal iron a very high ferritin and then we don't necessarily think it is the iron that's a problem it's something else causing it okay and there is there's communities of people in the alternative health world who do believe that excess iron is the root cause of a lot of different problems uh, especially unbound iron that they talk about uh, so maybe we'll get into that but yeah let's just start with ferritin um we've talked about that one already so there's also iron there's total iron binding capacity there's unbound iron binding capacity and then there's transferrin saturation those are the ones that i see uh usually some or all of them on people's uh test results so um let's go through them one at a time so iron it's probably self-explanatory right it's the amount of iron in the blood uh why would a person check that instead of ferritin um, or when would you check that? Hey, um, we, you know, we check, well, going back to, again, also the red blood cell count and hemoglobin, we often check hemoglobin. And then one of the most common causes of anemia or low hemoglobin is iron deficiency. Um, I would say then when you're looking at iron, um, you can, most people kind of zoom in on ferritin. And it's really only if there's a problem there that I see that people are necessarily then getting a more expanded iron panel um, so it's 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 likely that you might just have your ferritin on there and not necessarily anything else but generally if the ferritin is out of range then usually more investigations are done you'd be surprised i've seen a lot of people's test results where there there isn't a ferritin and there is just an iron or there's just an iron and a tibc it seems to vary a lot um so but yeah uh interesting yeah because i mean i was going to say that again i maybe i'm bit biased like having seen a lot of nhs test results but it's quite i often see just ferritin measured um but you know actually when you said iron the amount of iron circulating in the blood um that iron that's on a serum iron is usually still iron that is bound to transferrin which is a um a protein that kind of carries iron in the blood okay um, yeah. uh, what okay that's awesome what is let's just define what they are quickly and then we'll talk about the optimal ranges i think we'll get to that quite quickly so what is total iron binding capacity or tibc um it's just your um i mean i guess the easiest way to describe it is just your um ability to bind iron with transferrin uh and because this is one where it's easier to describe where if you're um if you're weak might have some chronic disease for example um then 
you might just struggle to bind that iron. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have um, that you have iron deficiency. So it's more. Um, that's one that I might have to think about a better way to explain it. But basically, it's just your blood capacities to to bind uh, iron with transferrin. Okay, fair enough. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about what it means higher low in a sec. What is unsaturated iron binding capacity? That'd be one I need to refresh though, to be honest, because I'd say that I used to, as a practitioner, very much demonize iron and, and high ferritin, but I actually see a lot of iron deficiency and uh, one that then, you know, we try to look for a root cause. Is there an absorption issue? Is there a, um, is there just low iron in the diet? Um, but I've actually, um, I do have a lot of patients that we actually do need to give them iron just in a more absorbable form. Um, yeah, so just kind of worth, worth taking to note. Okay. Um, well, let's, so, all right. So you said ferritin is the most important one that you look at. What's uh, an optimal level and then what's the level that a person should be concerned? So generally, the, you'll notice actually on blood tests that the reference range is very wide for ferritin. Um, and it, for it's somewhere like 12 to 150 uh, nanograms per milliliter for females, about 12 to 300 for males. Um, and this is where one where I think most functional integrative practitioners say that it's much too wide. Um, I... Per you know, and I might be a little bit biased, but I generally don't like to see it that high. I prefer seeing um, a, you know, a level sort of for females between, between sort of like 70 um, and, um, and 100 for females. Because um, I generally find that a lot of my uh, female patients really struggle to maintain their ferritin, but actually are are feeling okay at around even at around fifty. But I would say optimally, you know, seventy to a hundred. And then males, I prefer it to be a little bit higher. You know, generally kind of around the range of a hundred to hundred and fifty. But once you're over hundred fifty, I really start to worry about um, inflammation. Um, you know, and um, and there's, you know, there's a big debate here. Um, you know, I, I would say again that I have many females where we really are only able to get the ferritin to about 50, 60. And that actually seems to be, they seem to do fine with that. And actually that correlates to a very low inflammatory state. So uh, it's a bit of a tough one and one that I think it requires a bit of personalization. But um, we then correlated, of course, with the iron stores and with some of those other markers. I was going to say, I've tried to keep mine fairly low because of the tendency for it to act like a free radical if you have it too high. Um, but I've probably got mine a bit lower than your optimal range there. So I'm considering that now we're talking. So yeah, how do the other markers play into that then? Um, what's the point in having them? How do they expand upon it? What can they tell us? Um, let's start with iron itself, I guess. What's like an optimal level for that one? And um, and what's a concerning level? So just to kind of say that um, with iron levels, um, obviously if your ferritin level is high, but your iron is, is normal, then, you know, we are looking at things like inflammatory, um, um, you know, uh, we, we're looking at sort of more inflammatory markers. If your um, iron is high and your ferritin is high, that's where we're sort of looking at more iron overload. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I would say that, um, with, um, you know, generally I don't like iron to be too high. I would say it's, I, I look at it about halfway in the reference range and a bit lower. So, so generally, um, you know, this is one that can really vary based on the lab. Um, but I would say that, um, like serum iron, you're, you normally will see it somewhere between, um, you know, like 60, 60 to 150 micrograms per deciliter, um, or, um, or about 11 to 25, um, humoles per liter. And I'm generally looking at it to be kind of within that range, but sort of the lower half of, of, of normal, um, 
Okay. And that's yeah. because too much iron is an oxidant, right? It's uh, potentially inflammatory. Exactly. And I always, I mean, this is maybe kind of looking at it, maybe going a little bit off topic, but generally when I see high iron levels, I tend to see high other um, metals, high copper levels. Um, and I'm usually working to kind of get those numbers down. Okay. And you said copper, are you talking also heavy metals? Is that why you're concerned? Or With Heavy metals. Because I've even seen, um, you know, I've, even in those, um, in those patients where, you know, if, if iron levels are very high and ferritin is high, we sometimes worry about a genetic condition called hemochromatosis. And, um, and even you don't necessarily have to have the full condition. You can have a, you know, like one of the genes for it. Um, and, um, and so you might have slightly high ferritin levels, slightly high iron levels. Um, and if I see that and somebody has, um, I, I normally will also check heavy metals because I often tend to see a correlation with my patients with high high lead high mercury high copper um and actually sometimes I yeah sometimes I give chelating agents to try and get those levels down very interesting yeah because iron is a heavy metal right even if it's an essential mineral as well yeah okay so that's that's very interesting um what about if someone has quite low ferritin as I said I've kept, I've got mine quite low at the moment uh but right mid-range iron is that then indicate an issue no i mean i would say that's actually quite optimal um and that's why it's, it's it can be really difficult to kind of pinpoint like this is the number that i want it to be at because i would find there's a lot of variation with ferritin and um you know actually you see a lot of uh, i think more so women but a lot of people where ferritin is much is even below that 12 reference range <laughs> Um, and so it is very common to have very low levels. And then obviously that is that is too low. But some people just really struggle to increase that. And, um, you know, I, I've used different forms of iron, ones that are supposed to be a bit more absorbable, better tolerated. You know, for example, things like lactoferrin um, can be quite good um, to, to increase uh, ferritin. But some people just really struggle and then we're just we, we again we're looking at some of the other markers like if the serum iron is normal then maybe that person just just functions better on that lower range of ferritin mm, that's yeah. interesting uh what about the total iron binding capacity what does that tell us in addition and what level do we optimally want it at so you know it, this is an interesting one because generally if your um total iron binding capacity is high that means that your body really wants to bind iron with transferrin. So that's actually a sign of iron deficiency. Um, and, you know, uh, that one is so that one also can can really um, can vary um, between the labs. But I would say that, you know, looking at sort of the more um, the labs that I use, you know, the normal range is actually quite um it also is quite a wide interval like um somewhere between like 250 and 450 micrograms per deciliter um and which that's if you if you kind of convert that to um the micromoles per liter it's around sort of like 45 to 80 generally i'm looking for it to be kind of in in the um mid lower range but if it's in the lower range, wouldn't that mean that your body has a lot of iron, which also might not be good? If it's in the lower range, actually, it might means your body might just struggle to bind it. It might just be kind of weak in general. So often we associate low low TIBC with chronic disease. That's how I remember learning it actually in, in medical school. But chronic disease can mean many things. Um, um, but I generally do see, um, you know, if I see a persistently low, uh, a persistently low ferritin low total iron binding capacity that's where you know we we often see um chronic viral infections uh chronic fatigue low adrenal function um and actually we need to sort of work on on that and then sometimes you will see that that rise slightly to the middle range because you don't want it to go high either and uh lastly transferring saturation what's the optimal uh for that one so, so transfer and saturation is basically just a a ratio again of your serum iron to your total iron binding capacity. Um, I'm probably going to struggle to give you a range off the top of my head, but generally, um, you know, we know that if that is high, 
that means more serum iron. So that's going to be more iron overload. Or sometimes you'll see that rise with, uh, if, for example, you've had an IV iron infusion. Um, and a low uh, transfer and saturation, we'll see that with, again, low iron. So usually typically iron deficiency or chronic disease. Um, but that one also can go very high. Like I said, if you've, if you've had, uh, if you, for example, if you take iron and you take the iron too soon to getting a blood sample, it can be a bit falsely elevated. Uh, that's a good point. How long should people wait? Like how long should they not take iron before they do a test like this? Generally, um, I liked, so, I mean, I, Normally, I tell people to take iron earlier in the day, but with food. So I, I ask them to just make sure they fast it overnight and take the blood sample the next day. Um, okay. So ideally, yeah. almost 24 hours, something like that, exactly. 20 hours. Exactly. Okay. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today well thank you so much for your time dr miriam I, we're just gonna do one more category if that's okay and that's the kidneys because this is very important um and i think often overlooked so uh let's talk about kidney health i think kidneys and liver are one uh, something that's considered in the alternative community that like basically often people can go into a medical doctor and get medical test results and be told they're totally fine even though if they go to a naturopath or a chinese medicine doctor or whatever or a functional medicine doctor they may say your kidneys and your liver aren't doing great but is and we're just going to do kidneys for this video but is there anything useful that can be gained from like the standard tests that uh, are done by a medical doctor in terms of seeing how well your kidneys are doing in your experience Definitely. And I'd say that I'm seeing a big rise in kidney problems in younger and younger people. And I think, you know, in, I think in conventional medicine, people just generally think, okay, either my kidneys are fine, or maybe I'm a little bit dehydrated, or I have like kidney failure, and I'm going to be on dialysis. There's really like, um, I think, and then people get even doctors, I would say get confused, because I, I think there's a bit of a joke that even amongst um you know medical students that kidney diseases there's just so many and it's just such a kind of topic that most people don't find very interesting so we can tend to ignore it but actually just as you know i think i think people talk about the liver and detoxification so often but the kidneys are also just as important for detoxification if you think about it that's where all of your waste is kind of getting through you know out in your urine um and you know, I would say that even looking at the trends, like for example, your creatinine, if it's kind of, even if it, because usually what will happen when you go to your doctor is you will get your kidney markers checked. They'll be, they might be slightly out of range and you're just set, told that, okay, it's probably because you're dehydrated, just get them checked in six weeks. And then if they come back normal, you don't really have any further investigations. Um, but I would say nowadays with the rise of, um, for example, quite high protein diets, um, and high protein intake, uh, that does put some stress on the kidney just because you obviously have to process that protein. Um, so it's just worth making sure that your levels aren't persistently high and out of range. Hmm. Okay, well, you, you mentioned creatinine. I think creatinine and then EGFR um, kind of need to be explained together. Is that right? Could you, could you explain what they are? 
Yeah, so I mean, I guess we could start with um, EGFR, which is the um, the glomerul f filtration rate. So the glomeruli are just, um, if we were to look at your kidneys kind of in a microscopic sense, the actual cells there, um, the glomeruli are um, kind of, you know, like kind of part of the, the kidneys or kind of the, the microscopic bit that actually is doing a lot of the filtration. Um, and it's just, the EGFR is just the rate um, at which substances are being filtered through um, you know, the glomeruli and uh, basically the clearance of substances from, from your blood. And it's measured in, you know, uh, typically mils per minute. Um, and yeah, so, so generally you want higher EGFR, um, meaning you're filtering more things. And so you're, you know, you're, you're generally going to see your levels as like over, if it's normal, it's going to be over 90 typically. Uh, okay. And so optimal is really as high as possible. There's no too high number. Yeah, you won't actually, they won't measure it above that. They'll just say that it's over 90 typically. Um, so you're more, yeah, more worried if it's lower. Uh, no, in my test results, it, it tells a number, like it says, you know, it's been anything between 140 and 105, I guess, recently, which is not great by the sound of it from what you're saying. Um, so, but they base this on cretinine. This is what uh, I... Uh, well, that's the impression that I'm getting because it seems to correlate pretty much exactly with creatinine. Um, so what is creatinine and why is it measured for kidney function? So creatinine is just um, essentially a um, byproduct of, you know, when you're metabolizing um, creatine phosphate from the muscle. Um, but it's, you know, generally kind of a sign that if you are... Um, if you are um, filtering more out through the kidneys, that either you could be getting, you could be having more muscle breakdown. You could also um, be having just too much protein because generally the creatinine will, um, you know, you'll find that in muscle, so in meat, for example. Um, and you know, so generally, yeah, we want the higher creatinine, the more of. Um, the more creatine phosphate is coming into the body, so that you know, generally the higher. Then we're worried about some level of kidney dysfunction there. Okay, and so I mean, using the word creatine, a lot of people take creatine. It's it's one of the most researched supplements out there. It's supposed to be very safe. Some people take very large amounts. It exists in fairly large quantities in muscle meat anyway, because it's in the muscles, right? Um, so what would you say to someone, because I have heard this before, saying that, you know, having high creatinine levels is not necessarily a bad thing because it just indicates that you're working out a lot or that you're taking creatine? It certainly can be. If your filtration rate is good and then, so we have to, you usually have to take the two together. So if your filtration rate is good, you could just be, you know, exercising that muscles a lot. And as you, um, you know, as they, as they regenerate, you're going to, actually get rid of some of those metabolites too um so generally if the creatine is high i do normally blame it on either um you know supplementation protein intake as long as you looks like you're able to filter it out then that that's okay um but i have to say that we just you know Personally, I just don't want to see it too high because just it puts a bit of stress in the kidneys just to even get rid of that creatinine. So let me just clarify this because on my test results, it says EGFR. So the E stands for estimation, right? And it says it's calculated using your age, gender, ethnicity, and serum creatinine levels. So the only variable there, it seems, is the creatinine levels. So... The, so the G, it seems like the EGFR is entirely dependent on what the creatinine levels are in terms of the, the only variable that you can that you can alter. Does is that make sense, or am I misunderstanding something? Well, that's that's true. Um, but again, your kidneys do get um, in terms of it is important your age and your gender because we know that you know, for example, the older you get, the kidneys generally filter less. They do get a little bit sluggish, and they're just as susceptible to aging as other things. Also oxidative stress um, and you know for example certain conditions can really impact your kidney so then we would expect the filtration rate to also decrease um, and we know that um, you know men and women their filtration rate is slightly different 
Um, you know, we also know that, for example, like in pregnancy, your EGFR increases. Um, so that, you know, we do expect some some variety with that. Um, but, you know, you're, yeah, you're, you're right that I would say the one that you can vary the most day to day is your your creatinine clearance. Um, but because you can get it from multiple sources, it's not necessarily, um, it, you know, it. I guess to kind of dive a little bit deeper into it, your the amount of creatinine that you produce uh, also just depends on also how much muscle you have um, and, you know, and also your diet and supplementation. So it, I wouldn't necessarily say that you you always see high creatinine as necessarily a bad thing, but you want to correlate with how well you filtrate it. Because if you, if you have a low EGFR and a high creatinine, then something is leading to that creatinine buildup that can, and that can also just be a sign that you, you're struggling to filter. But what I mean is you will always have a low EGFR if you have a high creatinine, because it's the only variable that they use to estimate the EGFR. Do you see what I mean? According to this, it's the only variable. I understand. Sorry, it's the only controllable variable. <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> but I think I think you know they they sort of um, you you use cert when you're calculating your EGFR. Um, I, I would say that there is, you know, there is definitely a. Um, I would say those other markers can very significantly impair how well you you filter. So, uh, for example, I think they're not really calculating like chronic disease. But for example, we know that if you have an autoimmune kidney disease, then the way that you calculate your EGFR is going to be different. We would expect it to be a little bit lower. Um, uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think I'm just talking about standards self blood test maybe it's different when you're ordering tests for specific people um and and do some of these other markers help so we, we've got urea we've got creatine kinase and then we've got uh uh blood urea and nitrogen and even uh cystatin c um yeah can we go through well, whichever ones you actually use at one at a time, and you can tell us <laughs> what you use. Yeah, them for. I mean, I guess I should probably say that I rarely check kidney function because it's usually something that comes up on, um, on on a test. So it's only really if I'm trying to, if let's say nobody has an idea why someone's kidney function is low, um, then I start getting into these. But uh, you know, generally, you. Um, I would say, like for example, the number one cause I see of impaired kidney function um, is often is, is like diabetes. So usually you're correlating it with HbA1c and blood sugar levels. So it's very rare, I guess, that I find kind of isolated um, kidney function on its own. It's normally that once the kidneys have been affected by something, we know that it's either toxins, diabetes, something else. So it's usually kind of I don't look at it as a sole marker. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But for someone who's trying to optimize, especially someone who's trying to detoxify, then maybe look at it. From, maybe let's talk about it from that perspective. I think that's the most common reason yeah, people are interested in watching this. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and I would say that, um, like, for example, so urea um, or um, blood urea nitrogen is basically um, a waste product from protein metabolism. And so um, we know that if that is... And, and, that, you know, um, a majority of your urea is eliminated via the kidneys. Um, and so we know that if your urea is high, you're generally not clearing it from the kidney as you should. Um, and so, it, it, yeah, it's usually seen basically means that your kidneys aren't sort of filtering as they should. So we typically see it associated with low G EGFR. And is that related to uric acid? Uh, no, so that's a it's a different marker. So, um, yep. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, completely two 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 different things. Uric uric acid, you, um, you know, in terms of um, it's also. I mean, uric acid is technically also a waste product, um, but generally more from from purine breakdown, um, and a little bit different. I believe. I mean it. I have to say that, well, actually, I take that back. Maybe I need to look into this a little bit more. But urea, I know, is from ammonia metabolism, um, uric acid. Both actually are waste products. So I think you, but in terms of like clinical correlation, I usually test for it in slightly different scenarios. 
Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Uric acid usually relates to gout, right? Uh, is it not really a kidney marker? Uh, not not necessarily. I mean, too much uric acid will damage your kidneys too, because pretty much any too much toxins will damage your kidneys. But yeah, you're right. Like in the sense that urea, you'll typically see measured just on a basic blood test, whereas like you really only seek to measure uric acid typically if you're suspecting gout. In my experience. Okay. Uh, what about uh, creatine kinase? I think um, is that one that you ever checked? Um, I mean. You know, it's, again, it's quite interesting because it's one where creatine kinase you actually see um, it, it's just an enzyme that's found um, not only in um, not only in kidneys but also in in muscle in in the heart, um, and so elevated creatine kinase generally um, means that there can be some damage in any of those organs, not necessarily isolated kidney. Um, you know. Uh, problem with your kidneys um you know so generally i would if i see an elevated um creatine kinase i'm thinking more about more sort of like chronic disease or certain like medication side effects um but yeah not necessarily like sp something that's related to to kidney function okay um and then lastly i see a lot of people uh, in some of the groups I'm in, talking about cystatin C, which they believe is a superior way of measuring kidney function over the more classic EGFR. I say they believe it seems to be not easily available in the UK, so I have not had it tested personally. Um, do you have experience of this, and what's your uh, opinion on it? So cystatin C is a, um, a, a protein that's... Um, you know, actually produced by by many many different types of cells, but it is something that um, it is sort of taken up by um, some of your your um, parts of the kidney and it doesn't return to the bloodstream. So it's actually something that is a really good marker for filtration. Um, and you know, as you said, like with with um, your filtration rate, that is also there's an equation that's used to calculate that based on your age, gender, um, and other things. And so um, sometimes that can, that, you know, it's an estimated filtration rate and that might not actually be um, your real filtration rate. So we actually um, see something like cystatin C as um, a more reliable marker because we know that it's not going to kind of cycle back into the bloodstream, um, you know, and, um, it's also not dependent on, yeah, cystatin C is not dependent on age, race, gender, um, and unlike uh, creatinine. So, you know, we think that it's kind of a better marker of um, of kidney function and can help us sort of deduce if, um, you know, generally we, um, you know, we are a bit more, you know, we are a bit more worried with, you um, you know, whereas creatinine, for example, as we spoke about before, it can change based on your protein intake, supplementation. Generally, if the cystatin C is is high, it's usually not a good thing. It's usually more of a, a, a kind of a reliable marker of inflammation. Interesting. Okay, so maybe I will try and find that in the UK somewhere then. It does sound a lot better. <laughs> well, again, so for, you know, a lot of people watching, they may not have that available to them. Almost everyone will have an EGFR result if they've ever done any lab tests. So let's give them some guidance. Um, what would be an optimal level of EGFR? Uh, let's assume that they are getting a number and not just an above figure. Um, what's the level at which you're really happy with kidney function? And then what's the level that you might be concerned, like you might want to recommend some kind of level of support you know maybe it's herbs or something and then what's the level that at which case someone should really be going to a doctor because it's it's concerning i you know it's interesting because i think um again you know in the functional medicine world because i generally tend to see that patient where they've had their kidney markers checked on kind of your more basic blood markers i'm usually more worried about low egfr so if it's lower than definitely lower than 60 uh, I'm a bit worried that, you know, and want to figure out why are the kidneys so sluggish. If we know somebody is diabetic um, or has some autoimmune disease that affects the kidneys, then, you know, it can explain it. But obviously, we want to try and give things that help um, help kidney function. And that's actually where um, 
you know, apart from looking at protein intake, um, often looking at how people digest proteins can be very important and sort of helping with protein digestion. Um, in terms of kind of your most, um, you know, what would be an optimal EGFR? Um, I mean, I would say that, I mean, I generally, the first thing that comes to my mind is just more than 90. So uh, I think the fact that if, if it's much higher than that, that just means that you're really filtering through a lot of things and you might you might actually be just exposed to to more things you need to filter out. But I wouldn't say that, you know, I've ever in my clinical experience, like seeing, okay, if somebody has a hundred versus 120, that I think there's much of a difference there. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, and so creatine is going to be pretty much the opposite, right? So whereas with EGFR, you want it as high as possible with creatinine, you want it as low as possible, or is there a limit to how low you want it? I mean, you do want it, um, you, you don't want it to be too low because generally, um, you need to be having some cycling of kind of muscle breakdown and then muscle rebuilding. Um, you know, so, uh, generally, um, you know, I like to see it between, um, you know, something like, uh, 0.8 to, to sort of 1.2 milligrams per deciliter, or if it's in humoles per liter, something like 65 to 110 humoles for, um, per liter. Um, and for women, I think it's slightly less just because there's um, uh, less muscle mass typically women, but it's it's more or less that that amount, maybe just slightly lower. Um, but if it's too low, then you know you 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 know I do actually see this come up on a lot of um, blood tests, um, and generally it's not too serious if it's too low, but. I, if, if I see that somebody is a bit adrenally depleted, looks like they are not having a very nutritionally complete diet, then I can see that low creatinine as a sign that maybe we need to bulk up their nutrition slightly. Because they're not absorbing enough protein. Exactly. Mm, um, interesting. Yeah. yeah or, their muscle mass, yeah. or their muscle mass just might be too low and we really need to see, okay, are they doing anything to actually try and work or build up muscle or are they sarcopenic? I was going to say the time that I had the highest EGFR was mid 2022 and it was 140 and it's because my creatinine was like 59 which is below the level you say is optimal and yeah I was underweight at the time you know and probably having digestive issues so yeah it makes sense it definitely can be uh you know too, the creatinine can be too low or the EGFR maybe then could even be too high as it's based on the creatinine um you, you as you so yeah based on that it looks like the creatinine is really the more important one to look at that you really want it to be in that optimal range uh, and i would say i think you know cystatin c is actually a, a really good market i you know a lot of the cardiometabolic panels in the uk that are looking at things like oxidative um, like um, oxidative ldl or homocysteine often will check cystatin c um, so you can actually get that checked. Um, like I use the doctor's data cardiometabolic panel, but uh, um, you know, again, I, I'm usually sort of seeing it more in terms of like insulin resistance and is there um, a problem with like glycation and is that affecting kidney function? Because that's, I would say in my practice where I tend to encounter the most abnormal cystatin Cs, which is why I kind of kind of my brain goes into a bit computer mode and I'm just thinking, okay, cystatin C, some metabolic issue. Interesting. Um, okay, well, I know we've run out of time, so we're going to talk about that in the next episode. We'll talk about the pancreas and all of that blood sugar stuff. We'll talk about the liver and its capacity, and we'll talk about maybe, you know, some other things as well, like um, uh, the inflammation markers, maybe the proteins like al al albumin and globumin and stuff like that, cholesterol as well. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get into all of that in a up uh, future upcoming episode. Um uh, just just to finish, sorry, cystatin C, uh, what level would you want a person to be ideally and what level would they seek doctor's help? Really, it's, um, again, from the doctor's data panel that I usually run, it's the optimal range is about 0.5 to 1.5. Um, you know, I think if, unfortunately, most doctors, I don't think I've heard of cystatin C. So if you go to your doctor and ask about it, they probably will have no clue. Um, but if, if, like, so again, normally in those panels where they're measuring um, cystatin C, they will also measure creatinine and EGFR. So I would, um, I would um, probably, 
I wouldn't expect that to, I wouldn't expect to see an isolated cystatin C very much out of range without there being another effect on kidney function. But I would say that if that is completely out of range and you see you have it as an isolated value, it's worth making sure that you've checked things like your glucose levels, your insulin levels, because I would say that's where I see it most commonly out of range. Um, so that's where you might actually need to do a bit more digging as to like what could be kind of causing problems with filtration. Um, and, you know, things, for example, like heavy metals um, or environmental toxins. So that's probably one where there's not a good answer for like, when would you go to sort of a more acute service? You probably would have to, I would only go if your, you know, creatinine is out of range or your EGFR, but certainly a functional medicine practitioner should be able to, I think we'll have more and more experience about how to optimize kidney function. And uh, what would be the optimal level? I mean, just generally the middle of that range, I would say around one, yeah, yeah, one milligram per liter. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Miriam. This has been so interesting. I hope everyone uh, watching or listening uh, agrees. I suspect that if you're listening to this out and about while you're exercising or cleaning or driving or whatever, uh, try and listen to it again when you're actually in front of a computer or something and you can actually look through your blood test results because it's going to be a lot more interesting when you can actually, uh, you know, apply it to yourself or apply it to loved ones. Or if you're listening and you are a practitioner, then hopefully it's been helpful for you as well, helping you to see how you would perhaps apply it to, uh, you know, the people who you're working with. So, Dr. Miriam, um, tell us a little bit about uh, if people would like to find out more about you or if they would like to work with you, where would they go? I was just going to add a little addendum to what you just said that, you know, I think with blood markers being out of range, there is, of course, a lot of personalization there. So I would, wouldn't would panic if your levels are not in that optimal range that I said, um, because sometimes, for example, it, it can be very difficult to get somebody into that range, but they actually might be functioning pretty well, but they might have some thyroid dysfunction or have had a lot of, um, you know, let's say, um, history of um, chronic viral infections. So their white cell count might be just always a little bit lower. So um, it, it is worth, um, you know, I think it's worth knowing what your optimal ranges are, but don't sort of, you know, it's worth then investigating it in sort of correlation with your own personal circumstances too um and you know obviously someone who's trained in functional medicine could help you um you know and um so certainly you know i'm um i work um in my own clinic so people can always find me on my uh, minkitsky medical website um and you know if, of course if you are listening and you'd like to speak to me um i do offer of free exploratory calls so um you know feel free to book one of those if you'd like to speak to me directly um i would say that just also um you know with functional medicine has really increased in popularity so it's just worth um you know when you are speaking to a practitioner just to make sure that either they have some certification either with institute of functional medicine or um um, a for m or a kind of more reputable organization um so just i think you know, I would say it's good to kind of analyze who you're speaking to on the other end. So, um, yeah, just to add that. And your license to practice medicine as a medical doctor in the UK and in the EU, I believe. Um, but you can also do consultations with people throughout the world. You just can't prescribe to them if they're outside the UK in the EU. Um, and you also know a lot of people throughout the world, other practitioners who you can potentially refer people to if they're listening to this, but they're not based in the UK and the EU, right? Exactly. I can, you know, I can generally prescribe in the UK and all of Europe. Um, I, some of the pharmacies I work with can also ship all over the world. Um, but, um, you know, if you are looking for somebody who, if you're looking just for advice, um, you know, I can work on kind of as a sort of consultant for people who aren't in those two areas, but I then can't prescribe and, um, but certainly um, can help you find somebody or could, you know, just tell you a little bit about your um, health condition, what I would do in those circumstances. I generally can order tests though in America. It's actually quite, um, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, a lot of the um, companies that handle sort of testing are international and they just want a doctor to recommend it or a practitioner. So that's never a problem in terms of um, looking in depth there. 
Excellent. Yeah. And, I, and I just want to say, uh, Dr. Miriam is fantastic. She is very, uh, you know, experienced, very qualified, but also, as you can tell, very, um, you know, open-minded. I think the fact that you have the, ben uh, the background of traditional Chinese medicine and functional medicine and traditional medicine means that you see things from many different perspectives and you don't have that kind of dogmatic I hate to say it, but arrogance that most medical doctors do who are very indoctrinated in one system. You see things from, uh, you know, many different perspectives and you're really just focused on helping people. And as we said at the beginning of the interview, helping people optimize specifically, although of course you're willing to help people with, you know, whatever health issues that they have. But uh, so I, I think that Dr. Miriam is very rare and that's why I'm very happy to have her here and if she's willing to, you know, as a regular guest to answer these kind of medical questions that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, I would say the overlap between my approach, if I were a doctor, and Dr. Miriam's is at least 90%. So very most of the things that you've seen me recommend or say in previous episodes, I get so many comments saying, oh, well, and yeah, you could talk about optimizing thyroid or, or you know, it's probably the most common one, but I, no doctor is going to apply that stuff that uh, that you teach. Well, Here's one, <laughs> uh, Dr. Miriam. She can uh, help you optimize thyroid. Is exactly uh, you know one of the many things that she does, as well as you know all kinds of stuff. As you said, she's got background in emergency medicine and helping people with all kinds of issues. You can go to her website to, to I guess, see the full list. Um, but yeah, I think hormonal optimization is definitely one of the things that you specialize in, right, Dr. Miriam? Exactly. That's that. Yeah, that's very kind of you to say. I was just going to say that. Um, you know, I think. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that you always want to look at, look for in a practitioner, someone that is constantly learning. I mean, I you can even say, you know, when we we've been speaking here, um, there are some markers that, you know, I probably could, you know, generally if if it's going to be something that's relevant to someone's case, I'm somebody who tends to kind of dig quite deep into, you know, into the theory. Um, but I think you just want to find somebody who's a bit more open minded. And I do think the field is changing. I know that even. Um, you know, I've had quite a few referrals from GPs um, with thyroid health. And so I think there are some doctors that are listening when their patients are saying that, you know, they're not responding well on like traditional levothyroxine, for example. Um, and so I think the field is gradually changing uh, for the better. But, um, you know, I think, you know, it is kind of our duty to just to, to stay on top of things. And I, I generally, when I work with people, I try and keep your GP in the loop um, and I've been actually really surprised that most people especially if there's obviously if there's a good benefit and people feel a lot better that GP usually responds a bit more positively and uh, yeah I mean I think it's um, you know it's, it's a bit sad but often the way the reason people you know doctors get into functional medicine is because they themselves have been on the other side of that system where they they become chronically unwell and then they find that they're you know, they're not really being heard by traditional um, medicine. So, um, so yeah, so I think the field is changing, but certainly it's worth um, always trying to find a practitioner that's on your side kind of in that journey. Awesome. Yeah. Well, definitely follow up with Dr. Miriam if you would like some one-on-one uh, -on -one support. And uh, as always, please uh, like the episode. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment underneath. Um, if it's uh, about something relevant, I might well be able to ask uh, Dr. Miriam in future episodes. And uh, make sure you tune in for the next episode with Dr. Miriam, where, as I said, we'll probably go through liver, uh, blood sugar, pancreas function, um, cholesterol, and a bunch of other interesting stuff. And then we're going to do another episode where we talk about hormones. I think we'll definitely do one on thyroid optimization because Dr. Miriam has some very interesting things to say about that. And uh, we've been working on a specific protocol that I have not talked about before and I think is not well known. Um, so I'm very excited to share that with you. And then uh, hopefully Dr. Miriam will also be doing an episode with Chrissy where we talk about... Uh, female hormone optimization, which I am ashamed to say I don't know enough about. And so I'm very happy Dr. Miriam is going to uh, be sharing about that because, of course, that's, you know, really super important topic as well. And I think that is one of the things you've specialized in and helped a lot of women with already, right? Yes, I think, you know, when um, hormones in general are, um, you want somebody who can look at it holistically. So also obviously looking at gut function, adrenal function, um, and but obviously there's some key differences between 
men and women and how we optimize the hormones. And yeah, so obviously happy to, to, um, to speak about that in more detail. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for listening uh, and see you next time. Thank you for having me. Have a, have a good evening. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.